tonight escaping a ferocious fire in northern Alberta. Oh, it's a nervous wreck. I feel lost. I just wanted to go home. As the flames crept dangerously close, residents were told to get out and fast. How a town once devastated by fire is now offering refuge. From the streets to the courts, the battle over abortion in America. And why here in Canada it may be legal, but that doesn't mean it's accessible. This is the first time in Canada that a zoo owner is facing criminal animal cruelty charges. A hundred exotic animals in rundown cages, some going thirsty. What else Quebec officials found at a roadside zoo? This is the night. Tonight, thousands of northern Albertans are waiting, watching, and likely trying to will a wildfire away from their homes. They've fled, ordered out as the fire burns out of control, just about five kilometers from the small town of High Level. The flames are towering, and the threat as this fire rages just a few kilometers from town is big. The pictures make that clear, and so do the numbers. It's only one of around two dozen wildfires burning in Alberta right now, but it is by far the biggest, nearly 800 square kilometers in size. On a wildfire intensity scale that only goes to six, it is a six. The fire is jumping from crown to crown of trees. Too dangerous to attack from the ground, dozens of water bombers are waging a war from above. And firefighters are heading in from other provinces to help. High Level's mayor wants her residents to know their homes are safe for now. The fire continues to move and continues to be dangerous, but at this point is moving away from the town. RCMP have patrolled nightly and as well as the fire department. Many of the nearly 5,000 evacuees headed south to Slave Lake, right into the arms of a community that knows exactly how devastating a wildfire can be. Aaron Collins now with how many there are paying it forward. Out of control and on the move, this fire is as dangerous as they come and destructive, knocking out power and cell service to high level, forcing thousands to evacuate late yesterday, many making it out with just the bare necessities. Just my clothes, my IDs, that's, that's all we left. I left everything. It's what we needed to go. I didn't have much time to pack. Uh, it's become something of an unwelcome spring tradition in northern Alberta. Wildfires chasing people from their homes, followed by makeshift caravans scrambling to safety. Oh, you can feel the heat. It was a similar scene three years ago as the city of Fort McMurray was evacuated. About 2,500 homes and businesses were eventually reduced to ash by the blaze dubbed the Beast. In 2011, it was Slave Lake that burned, leaving more than 700 people homeless. Slave Lake's mayor was working as a firefighter when his town was evacuated. He says that what his community went through then makes it the perfect refuge for the 700 people from high level who've come here for shelter. It's been really great from the community, overwhelming support from residents, uh, businesses saying, hey, I'm ready, my doors are open, I'll babysit kids, I'll walk dogs, I'll do whatever you need. An understanding that is a comfort to this province's latest wildfire evacuees. We're so thankful that we, Slave Lake is really like our home for now. And then, yeah, we're, we're still, like our heart's still there. We're still hoping that there's no damage in our properties. Evacuees are being told they should be prepared to be out of their homes for at least 72 hours. Of course, as it always does, it'll be the weather that inevitably decides that. And unfortunately for those out of their homes tonight, more warm, dry weather is forecast for the coming days. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Slave Lake, Alberta. So Mother Nature may not be helping out, but there are extra forces on their way. British Columbia's Wildfire Service says it will send 267 personnel over the next two days to help wherever they're needed in the province. Crews from Ontario and Nova Scotia are also expected to join in. All right, let's turn now to the United States and an issue dividing the country and sparking an emotionally charged debate. Absolutely. That's one over the right to an abortion. And in every state in the United States today, protesters fought against what they call a step backwards. 
New restrictions have been passed in eight Republican-led states. Now, some have banned abortions once a fetal heartbeat can be found. And in Alabama, there's no exception for cases of rape or incest. One of the biggest rallies was held today outside the U.S. Supreme Court, the very place, as Lindsay Duncombe reports, where so many fear this fight will end up. There are new fears behind the pro-choice protests across the United States. Fears rooted in old stories. It's terrible. I have friends that died from coat hanger abortions. I don't want my granddaughters to die. The scariest prospect for these crowds is that Roe v. Wade, the 1973 decision legalizing abortion in the U.S., could be overturned. The logic behind those fears goes like this. Alabama and other states deliberately passed laws to challenge Roe. The United States, under the Constitution and laws. And the Supreme Court now has two new conservative justices appointed by a president who supports banning most abortions. But experts say that doesn't mean Roe versus Wade is doomed, at least not yet. What's happening now in Alabama and in Missouri is like a sledgehammer. Um, they're making it virtually impossible to get an abortion, and the court won't tolerate that. Lower courts are likely to strike down the state laws. If, as expected, the laws are appealed to the Supreme Court, the justices may be reluctant to take up a case that so blatantly challenges established law. And no matter who appointed them and why, even the new justices may not want to look as though they are being manipulated by political masters. I think Roe versus Wade is uh, secure for the foreseeable future, uh, or at least for the immediate future. Many believe that what's more likely than a reversal of Roe versus Wade is that the court will continue to chip away at access to abortion, allowing states to make it tougher and tougher to get the procedure without outlawing it completely. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. And abortion is legally available in Canada, but that does not mean women across the country have equal access. Katie Nicholson looks at some of the barriers and found a whole new occupation has sprung up to help women get past them. What does an abortion doula do? That's what these people are here to learn. A lot of it is just support and information. There are abortion services in every province and territory, but accessing them isn't always easy. Abortion doulas are emerging to help guide women through the process. Shannon Hardy has seen the need for these services firsthand in the Atlantic provinces. We had someone who was quite young and couldn't speak to the people, the nurses on the phone at certain times because, you know, family members were around. So unfortunately in this case, she missed the window for uh, using medication, that's Mepigai Miso, um, and did end up having to come into the city for a surgical. There are two types of abortion, medical and surgical. Which type a woman can choose depends on where she lives and how far along she is. Typically, medical abortions induced by a pill are offered up to nine weeks gestation. But if a woman wants a surgical abortion, the cutoff varies greatly across the country from 13 to 24 weeks. It even varies within provinces. Take BC, where surgical abortion cutoffs range from 12 weeks in Cranbrook to 23 weeks in Vancouver, where there are greater resources in case there are complications. The Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada maintains a directory of abortion clinics. It lists 60 facilities across the country that provide services, but they tend to be concentrated in urban centres. In Alberta, the only places you can get an abortion are Calgary or Edmonton. That's a rural population. There's a lot of women that don't live anywhere close to Calgary or Edmonton. This legal activist says even Canada's weather and geography can work against women seeking an abortion. Even winter conditions can make it near impossible to get to an abortion providing hospital uh, within the time frame. But travel time and costs aren't the only roadblocks. Stigma is a huge barrier for women seeking abortion services. Something these doulas are hoping to change one woman at a time. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. The federal party leaders in Canada seem to agree that they would not reopen the abortion debate. They've all said as much, with the exception of Maxime Bernier, the leader of the People's Party of Canada. Today, 
He said his members would be free to move a private member's bill and then vote their conscience. Canada is in a difficult diplomatic position with two rather angry countries, Saudi Arabia and China, and there's been little progress in mending fences with either of them. Let's start with China. Relations chilled when Canada arrested Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou in December. China detained Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver soon after. As David Cochran tells us, critics say it's time Ottawa tried something new to cut the tension. The Prime Minister is taking a victory lap for settling the stubborn tariff standoff with the United States. But he's also taking questions about an even more stubborn and nowhere near settled standoff with China. China is playing uh, stronger, making stronger moves uh, than it has before to try and uh, get its own way on the world stage. And uh, uh, Western countries and democracies around the world are pulling together to point out that this is not something uh, that we need to uh, uh, continue to allow. Trudeau and his foreign minister, Christian Freeland, have spoken directly to many of those world leaders, trying to increase the global pressure on China. But the one country they can't get on the phone is China itself. I have sought uh, repeatedly a meeting with Wang Yi, the foreign minister, my counterpart. Thus far, that meeting hasn't happened. But if Chinese officials are listening to us today, let me repeat that I would be uh, very, I'm very keen to meet with Minister Wang Yi or to speak with him over the phone at the earliest opportunity. We allowed the situation to really spiral out of control over the last few months and now it's clear the Trudeau government can't get their calls returned. So along with the indirect diplomacy of lobbying world leaders, Canada is also relying on lower level diplomacy, such as the parliamentary delegation that is in China right now. Rob Oliphant, the parliamentary secretary for foreign affairs, is part of the trip and is raising the issue directly with Chinese officials. But the Conservatives say Oliphant will get no face time with top decision makers. It's certainly not a substitute to the Prime Minister or the Minister engaging with their counterparts. Canada is talking, but is China listening? In the meantime, the two Michaels, Spaver and Kovrick, can only wait and hope. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. When it comes to Canada's frosty relations with Saudi Arabia, some Saudi citizens have faced consequences. Riyadh moved to pull students in Canada out of the country after Ottawa raised concerns about the kingdom's detention of activists. As Kayla Hounsell tells us, nine months later, some Saudi students remain in Canada, but they are keeping their heads down. Allah. Among the crowd at this Halifax mosque are university students from Saudi Arabia. We don't know who they are because they're afraid to identify themselves for fear of what their government might do to their families back home. They were ordered out of Canada last summer. Some of them, it was, they were really sad about that. They were about to finish, they settled here, they have been here for years. They know the city, they have their homes, their cars, their belongings, everything. Nine months later, CBC News has learned many of the students stayed or left and came back. It took us a while to even absorb it. Then I went into depression. This Saudi student, whose identity we are protecting, was on a full scholarship from the Saudi government. He's managed to stay by paying his own way. We're broke. We used everything we have. I would say that was the hardest period of my whole life. But many students were able to continue without losing their Saudi scholarships. Medical students specifically were allowed to continue, as were students whose studies were nearly complete. There are still about 5,000 Saudi students studying at Canadian universities, down 2,500 from before the diplomatic crisis. Over the ensuing weeks, through really good, effective dialogue, we had the opportunity to, uh, to make sure the worst did not occur. For universities, those students mean money because international fees are so much higher than Canadians pay. Mount St. Vincent, for example, took a $900,000 revenue hit. Others like Dalhousie and McGill, which have med schools, were less affected. The big thing that did for us it ex is it exposed just how vulnerable we are. Teaching hospitals rely heavily on Saudi residents to provide vital patient care. The Saudi government is not expected to sponsor any new students when current students graduate. So in Nova Scotia, for example, the province is funding new resident positions for Canadians. 
and universities are trying to attract students from other countries to help close the gap and reduce the risk. It's a political issue. This Saudi student resolve calls his government's decision childish and irrational. Resolve it in any political way you see, but don't involve students and people who are trying to, to study and make a living. And we have nothing to do with all of this. He says he had planned to go home after completing his education, but now hopes to stay in Canada. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. A Quebec roadside zoo owner was arrested. His zoo, now in the hands of animal welfare investigators. They say the Saint Edouard Zoo was a scene of cruelty and neglect, finding a collection of animals trapped in poor conditions. Some roadside zoos have faced scrutiny and fines before, but as Simon Nakaneshny explains, charges like this are really unusual. Bears, kangaroos, lions, kept in cages and fenced enclosures. Over 100 exotic animals living in dilapidated conditions, says the Humane Society, some with no access to water. We've witnessed animals that are um, in apparent need of veterinary care, and we have a medical team uh, on site that will be able to provide that care. Today, SPCA agents arrested the zoo's owner, Normand Traon was charged with animal cruelty and neglect under the criminal code. If convicted, he could face up to five years in prison. This is the first time, to our knowledge, that in Canada a zoo owner is charged with criminal animal cruelty. The zoo has a long history as a tourist attraction in the region, dating back to 1957. Traon bought it in 1989, but over the past decade he's faced scrutiny and fines from the province's Ministry of Wildlife. In August, the SPCA seized two alpacas from the facility. It also found four dead animals, including two tigers. Traun had been trying to sell the operation so he could retire. His lawyer says the arrest came as a shock. Traun tried to go back to his zoo this afternoon. He was blocked by authorities. The Humane Society says it will start moving the creatures to sanctuaries across North America, a complex process that could take weeks. But if Traun is acquitted, the animals could end up back behind these gates. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. There are at least 100 roadside zoos across Canada, and regulations vary from province to province. The zoo organization, CASA, has specific standards for animal care, but only seven in Quebec have CASA accreditation, and saint Edward Zoo was not one of them. Here's some of the other stories we're following tonight, including severe weather moving through the southern United States. It was so scary. I just thank God we're all okay. That's all that matters. At least 21 tornadoes have been reported in the last two days across four states, and then came the flooding. There have been more than 40 water rescues in just one county in Oklahoma. Severe storms still expected in Missouri, Illinois, and Arkansas. Growing questions tonight about the disturbing case of this baby in Chicago. His mother was murdered. He was taken from her womb. A woman then took the baby to hospital and claimed him as her own. Now authorities are investigating why the hospital took two weeks to alert police. I'm just thinking in my own mind, if I see somebody coming in with a baby with an umbilical and a placenta, why does the mother look like she's in, in good health? Police said the baby had no brain activity, but he opened his eyes Sunday. Doctors still not sure if he'll survive. Still ahead on The National, a new kind of retail experiment. That doesn't sound like something I need. How online brands are making their brick and mortar debut. And later in our moment, taking the Kawhi Leonard fever to the next level, why Raptors fans say the writing, or rather the painting, is on the wall. <laughs> but first, plants, herbs, and cannabis. The green edition changing the gardening industry. I'm not even a big user of cannabis. I really just excited to have it in my garden. Uh, without the stigma or the illegality and just have it be in its place among my other plants here. It is gardening season for a lot of Canadians, and for the first time it's legal to grow cannabis alongside your flowers and herbs. 
Every province except Quebec and Manitoba is following the federal law, which allows households to grow up to four plants indoors or out. As Diane Buckner shows us, it's given rise to yet another new sector of Canada's blossoming cannabis industry. You got hazelnuts, currants, raspberries, plum, a little medicinal herbary over there. Matt Saltis is a botany student, a father of two, and a first-time grower of recreational cannabis. We're just mixing in compost we make from our, all our kitchen scraps. He started these plants indoors in February. Now that it's warm enough, he's ready to transplant them into his backyard garden. And it could easily get like six feet tall, six feet wide. Really? Uh, it could easily get that big. I'm not even a big user of cannabis. I really just excited to have it in my garden. Uh, without the stigma or the illegality and just have it be in its place among my other plants here. Nothing on here is labeled cannabis. All these products work for all types of plants. Alex Ray is seeing new faces at his gardening store, which specializes in supplies for homegrown cannabis. Up until recently, the focus here has been on indoor growing, hydroponics for medicinal use. Good afternoon, homegrown. Since recreational use was legalized, though, outdoor gardeners are coming to shop. For the price-conscious consumer, if you're paying around $10 a gram or more um, for the varieties at the store, you might be only paying 50 cents a gram or less for a variety that you grow yourself at home. Even Scott's miracle Grow, a well-known brand of fertilizer, has a cannabis division, Hawthorne Gardening. It's also been focused on hydroponics, but the company sees new opportunity. We love the way that the laws in Canada come down. A lot of research and development folks have a lot of exciting things um, in there, what we call our innovation pipeline. Um, a lot of those are focused on outdoor growing as we see that continue to emerge. But many provinces have seen supply problems with the processed product, and now there's a shortage of seeds as well. These are Tweed Baker Street seeds. This retail chain has a limited supply of just one variety. Four seeds cost $60. Legalization is new. October 17th was just a few months ago. So uh, we know that our selection of seeds will absolutely grow. Matt Saltis has what he needs for a good harvest in the fall. He has just one worry, theft. I kind of advise people to plant it uh, with visibility from neighbors in mind. So obscured by fences or other bushes, um, out of the way of people. Although we can't do much about the scent when it's in full flower, unfortunately. Hazelnuts and raspberries present no such problems, but cannabis aficionados may be convinced homegrown weed is worth the trouble, no matter the pitfalls. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Guelph. Still ahead, why Jamie Oliver is closing most of his restaurants. Up next, Michael Buble on the moment that changed him forever. A lot of the things that I thought mattered just are not important. And I think, um, you know, I really wanted to experience the positive things in life. You know that face, Michael Buble. He is soaring, packing stadiums around the world. His latest album, Topping Charts, earning him another Juno. But he has made it clear he doesn't really care about that. As he said to CBC Radio's Tom Power. For me, it was like... Um, there was a snap moment. The snap. Well, that came from a time of struggle for Buble and his family that changed him. And Tom connected with that moment and so much more. Here's a second look at that interview. Michael Buble! Michael Buble is back. Two years ago, the Canadian crooner stepped away from the spotlight. His then three-year-old son, Noah, had been diagnosed with cancer. So Buble stopped everything, focusing on Noah's treatment and being a father. As the son recovered, Buble slowly re-emerged, accepting a 2017 Governor General's Performing Arts Award. Good evening, Vancouver! And last March, hosting the Junos in his beloved hometown. You can't know what it means to me to be here. It's been a couple years since I've been on stage. Love, it's all that I can give to you. Since stepping on that stage, life for Michael Buble has been on an upswing. Let's go, let's go. 
Doctors say Noah's cancer is in remission. Michael Buble and his wife welcomed a baby girl to their family. When I fall in love. And that's all being celebrated with a return to music and his 10th album, simply titled Love. I met up with Michael Buble earlier this week in Toronto. I'm sweating already. I feel good. Okay. Just wait till they start grilling you. It's a stupid start coat. Sweating. Let's do it. Ready to do it? Yeah. Michael Buble. Action! Top! Nice to see you. Last really time, nice to see you again. Last time I saw you was backstage yeah. at the Junos. Yeah. And you were giving me hosting tips. Yeah. You well, because it's because I think you're that night, because mm -hmm. this was the that's like the, the, the party of the industry party. There's like a, how many people are in that room? A couple thousand people? A couple thousand people, it's yeah. It's a big room. And you were what, very sweet. I was very nervous. So was I, I think. Like you came up to me and you were like, Hey man, are you nervous right now? I was like, yeah, I'm a little nervous. Because I'm so nervous about tomorrow night. I'm not cursing. I can't, I can't curse as much as I want to right yeah. now. Because yeah. I was cursing. Yeah, you were cursing. We were I both know, cursing. Yeah. And it was, I'm so nervous about tomorrow too, man. But we're going to be all right. Just get up there. Get up there and look them out in the eye. And you're funny. And go out and tell them your jokes. Because they should laugh at them. And, and then you killed it. It was all right. Then you go out and killed it. It yeah. didn't go too bad. So then this the next night, room. next night you get up in the arena. I mean, this, mm -hmm. is, this was a big moment. How did you feel when you got up there? I feel the same way no matter what I do now. I feel like everything is easy. No nerves. There's no, listen, I think I care. I think I, there's a sense of wanting to have integrity with what I do and wanting to be good. I think everybody wants to be good. I would agree with but you. But I think, you know, when everybody's in, in all of our lives. We all go through hard things. And I think when you go through really hard stuff, I think it makes other things relative. And you say, wow, I thought this was tough, but no, this, this is easy. So that night and, and all the other nights and this interview and all the performances that I do, I actually really pray, practice, meditate on just enjoying and, and knowing how lucky I am. Well, I want to talk about the new album. I want to talk about the future and all that stuff. Sure. I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about what you've gone through, not in any big detail. I just want to ask how your son is doing. He's great, thank you. He's doing all right? He's great, thank you. And it's, if you can imagine, now I've gone to, I don't know how many countries, and every interview, of course, um, this is a question. Yeah. So for me, I, I understand that there's a, you know, I, it's something I need to acknowledge, but I am so ready to, to, um, to move on. Well, that was, my, that was my next question, is that like, how, how, how have you found the actual act of people like me asking you about something incredibly personal in your life, like your son's um, cancer and your son's remission. I don't think it's because you're a jerk. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think that, you know what I mean? Your job as a, as a journalist is to, is to ask, to interrogate, to, you know what I mean? To find, you, you want to find out about the person. But I think it's, it's um, you know, it's painful for me. And, and also, I, it's not fair to my, to my family and to my kids. No, and it's... Because they... they and I mean, when I say it's not fair, it's you can ask them whatever you want, but um, they deserve the chance to move on, and they deserve the chance to be able to, to sort of, not sit back in the past, but to be able to look ahead to the future and to be excited about all the beautiful things that are happening. And so, I think it's more Tom about me having to have the strength, and also to stop being so Canadian. Mm -hmm. And not to allow it or to indulge it. I have to like say to you, let's move on to the next question. You well, know what I mean? Not, well, it's, not, it's not really any of our business. But you know, I think one thing that's been clear to me even so far in this conversation is that some sort of transition happened to you personally. Like you said, you, you said after what I went through, after you go through something hard like this, after what my family went through, you can't help but. So all these things lead me to believe that some kind of mental, existential transition happened. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah, and I think, you know what, I think it should. I think I realized that a lot of the things I had worried about, a lot of the things that I thought mattered, just are not important. And I think, um, you know, I really wanted to experience the positive things in life and the beautiful things because I, I got a sense of mortality. I got a sense of um, the, truly the things that are important in life. And um, for me, every single moment started to matter, and being in the moment started to matter, and but, being awake in that way. And Michael, is that, is that change an immediate 
change? For or, me, it was. Or is that something that you have to uh, work no, on? No, Tom, for me, it was like, um, yeah, there was a snap moment. There was not a, it was not a matter of weeks or a mantra I told myself. It just happened very, just very quickly for me. And I, I think the understanding of how my, my world changed or how I saw how who I wanted to be changed very quickly. And I realized that uh, I wanted to have a mission in my life to be kind. And I thought to myself, you know what? I don't want to indulge the cynical people. I don't want the negativity in my life. I want to just bring joy. This world is tough enough and cynical enough and scary enough. And I just want to bring love. I definitely understand the impulse to want positive things around you all the time. But I have to admit that I'm listening to you and going, sometimes the world is hard. It's just a hard place it and it's hard to avoid. It is. It's hard to turn that stuff off. Uh, from politics, the divide of gov you know, government, from everything, I mean, there was just so much stuff there happening. Is, there, there is, there is. racial divide, <laughs> the, uh, you know, Brexit and Donald Trump, and it was just like, I could, you know, the world feels like it's falling apart, and I just didn't want any of the negativity. And it's why I... Um, it's hard not to wake up in the morning and check your phone. And, feel and I have way. days, so many, just like you, and just like everyone else, where I, I am so not the guy that I want to be. Yeah. And I, and I think part of that is, uh, for me anyway, is, um, man, this is really good therapy for me. Thank you so much. I'm going to bill you. You should bill me. <laughs> I'm literally going to walk away feeling better and lighter and... Tell me what you do in the bad days. What do you do in the bad days? The truth? Yeah. If you want to. Okay, I'll tell you. So I was in London and I was feeling anxious. I had to do a really big TV show called The Graham Norton Show. Because I only have eyes for you, dear. And I was like anyone would be. I was trepidatious and nervous that I wouldn't be funny or myself or, I, you know, the, the anxiety was getting to me. And, um, and so I called home on, uh, what do you call it, Skype? I had my two, my two kids looking at me, and they said, boys, Poppy's nervous, I'm scared. Uh, it's getting to me today. Uh, and I said, would you pray for me? Would you help me to remember what's important? And uh, they closed their eyes and God knows what it is they said, because they didn't say it out loud. Uh, I just heard one of my kids <laughs> finish off and say, like, amen. And then he said, he looked at me and he said, okay, Poppy, you know what? <laughs> I, uh, I talked to God and it's going to be okay. And man, I just instantly, I felt like I just remembered again, you know? And I only have I, you know? Tell me about the decision to make this new record. Can I show that. you something? Yeah, lay it on me. Can I have my phone? Because this is, this is the weird part. Mm -hmm. So before I, I saw you, I didn't know about, I had no idea if I was going to make a record. So this was the night at the Junos, yeah. the night before the Juno broadcast. So a couple, like a month before that, yeah. I invited all these guys over to my house and we just had fun. And we started to make music and, um, and the record came that day me sitting in our, our living room jamming. And I, I was like, I, I had forgotten how much I loved music. Or, really? You forgot? Or make, yeah, not yeah. forgotten. Yeah. I had forgotten how much I loved making music with those guys. Yeah. And, um, oh, here. So check this out. So have you heard the record yet? Yeah. You have, okay. Yeah, so like dance. you can name a song, like When You're Smiling. When You're Smiling. So check this out. This is, so I put the, I put the phone up against the piano. Mm -hmm. And... So drum and bass up front or what? Is it your house? When you're smiling, when you're smiling. And that's it, man. The whole and you can go through the list of songs and they all just came like that. And so it's been really funny because David Foster, we, we had met again months before that even. Right. And he said to me, I'm retired. I'm never coming back. Right. And I said to him, yeah, and he said, what about you? Are you going to are you going to come back? And that's I what said, they said that's what they said about you too, right? Yeah, and I was like, well, that was that was some bullshit. 
yeah. from the uh, yeah, obviously that's not true. Tabloid bullshit. Out, but, but anyway, yeah. and I looked at him and I said, what about you? He said, nah, I'm done. I'm retired. And, and I said, oh, but wouldn't it be fun if you and me could go into the studio and like just be family again? And like, and I think that day it sort of put a spark into the other man's mind. Mm -hmm. And then about a year later, we were making beautiful music. Michael, thanks, Michael. Thanks so much. Nice talking to you. It's, not, it's always nice talking to you. You know what the truth is? We could throw away the cameras. I think we should. We could get some drinks and I could hang out with you like this all day. I can't wait. You let me know. I got lots of bars in my neighborhood. Dude, I like the way you say bars too. Everyone could do that with Tom though. From Instagram to brick and mortar, the new trend hoping to attract shoppers offline. You don't see a lot of clutter here. You don't see fixtures everywhere. You don't see a single mannequin in the store. Those are things that the traditional retailer would be like, whoa, why aren't you doing that? You gotta maximize your sales per square foot. But first, a look at a story we will have tomorrow night here on The National, all about the EU elections and the rise of the Brexit party with one very familiar message. From Brexit champion to political pariah. Nigel, Nigel, over here. Now he's basking in the limelight again. Well done, you. Will Nigel Farage put his stamp on Britain's future? You got a big kiss on that as well. His supporters believe it. The government fears it. Either you listen to us and deliver Brexit, or at the next general election, we will come and replace you. Thank you. For weeks, Farage has been crisscrossing the country, promoting his upstart Brexit party. An easy name to remember for a new party with no other policies but to push for a hard EU exit. We will not allow the president to block congressional subpoenas, putting himself and his allies above the law. The U.S. Congress is threatening to go to court and enforce subpoenas in its investigation into possible obstruction of justice. Former White House counsel Don McGahn skipped his hearing today. The committee's also issued subpoenas to former White House officials Hope Hicks and Annie Donaldson. An Alaskan air carrier has suspended operations after two deadly float plane crashes in a week. Last week, a Taquan Air float plane collided with another aircraft in midair that killed six people, including a Canadian. And now another Taquan plane crashed yesterday, killing the pilot and a passenger. Taquan volunteered to stop its sightseeing and commuter flights for now. In the heart of New York City, an experiment is underway. After years of bricks and mortar stores closing up shop and heading online, one mall is turning the retail experience on its head. It's bringing online stores to a bricks and mortar location, the opposite. Stephen D'Souza takes us to a mall with a whole floor dedicated to brands that started online. Take a look at New York's latest tourist attraction. The vessel in New York's new Hudson Yards neighborhood is eye-catching and Instagram friendly, designed to draw crowds. Inside the shopping mall next door, they're also hoping to draw crowds using a sort of retail experiment. An entire floor filled with stores you've never seen before, at least not physically. We try and keep it very curated, very guided, very minimal. Until now, men's clothing retailer Mack Weldon only existed online. This is their first physical store. A big step, putting them up beside some big names. This is like showing up for your first game and it's the Super Bowl. The current American retail landscape has been called apocalyptic. So far in 2019, U.S. retailers have announced they'll close more than 6,000 stores. That's more closings than all of last year. Faced with that reality, the company behind Hudson Yards realized that to keep up foot traffic, they had to go where shoppers are going online. So they brought the disruptors to them, dedicating an entire floor to brands making their brick and mortar debut. The whole revolution of what was happening online and how aggressive online buying was becoming somewhat at the cost of bricks and mortar was stunning and we couldn't ignore that. So I think the trend's going to continue. I think this marketing professor says landlords need to get creative to attract shoppers. 
Landlords need to have rent, they need the cash flow. You know, they don't want to have for rent signs, you know, in empty, in empty storefronts. A few years ago, this block in Greenwich Village was filled with those empty storefronts. Then the developer offered incentives to bring these brands off the web and onto the street. Professor Weiner says they're following big names like mattress maker Casper and eyeglass giant Warby Parker, which started the shift, recognizing that the money is still in stores. Still 90% of all retail sales take place in a store, in a physical store. So this is actually one of our best sellers. It comes but at a time of record store closings, can the new kids on the block avoid the mistakes of the old guard? The key, the new players say, give the customer an experience they can't get online. We actually find that customers that shop online and shop within our physical spaces will spend more over their lifetime value. It is great to see the product in person. Using the information they gather means the store becomes a lab, where they're constantly testing new ideas, products, and layout. You don't see a lot of clutter here. You don't see fixtures everywhere. You don't see a single mannequin in this store. Those are things that a traditional retailer would be like, whoa, why aren't you doing that? You gotta maximize your sales per square foot. But experts say don't look for this new wave of retail players to sweep across the country, filling up empty malls. They'll pick and choose their spots, likely big and busy cities, where they can prove their success online will work offline in the real world. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Up next on The National, the street art that's already on its way to becoming a Toronto landmark. You know the one I'm talking about. That one shot in that picture right there was very pivotal in that if he missed it, I'd say he might be leaving, but he made it and he's the king of the city right now. What fans want Kawhi Leonard to know, that's next in our moment. But first. In case you missed it, Jamie Oliver's brand has taken a hit. Who doesn't like a good old curry? Well, my granddad didn't like him, but you know. Sure, the celebrity chef built an empire as a TV star, cookbook author, and a cheerleader for good nutrition. To bring better food to all Canadians. But today, Jamie is Italian. His chain of 25 restaurants sought bankruptcy protection, and a thousand jobs vanished. Canada's two outlets aren't affected. Come in and see us at Jamie's Italian. Business began to slide a few years ago, only partly due to Brexit anxiety and the rise of food delivery. It's just got a bit too chain... Chainy. Chainy. There's just so many other great places around, just so much competition. Oliver tweeted today that he is devastated. I am deeply saddened by this outcome and would like to thank all of the people who have put their hearts and souls into this business over the years. He previously said about 40% of his ventures have ended in failure. With an estimated personal fortune of 300 million bucks Canadian, he seems to know when to call it quits. So here's the thing, a Toronto sneakers store has commissioned a major mural of the Raptors star player Kawhi Leonard and fans cannot stay away from it. In this selfie taking era, people naturally showing up to take pictures in front of Leonard's triumphant figure and their dedication to Toronto's most popular person, well that's our moment. He's our guy. Hopefully forever, we'll see what happens. But obviously we have a lot of respect for what he did. Even stay or leave, like what he brought for Toronto is huge. I came to actually see the mural, yeah, yeah. I wanted to take a picture. I'm gonna go to the uh, Jurassic Park later on tonight. That one shot in that picture right there was very pivotal in that if he missed it, I'd say he might be leaving, but he made it and he's the king of the city right now. We came here last week and it was a totally different Kauai mural, so I had to get this picture and the shot of him. It's very exciting for the city. I hope that he keeps, he stays with the Raptors and that we keep him here and hopefully he continues to bring us through to the finals. We're just happy he's here. If we do get other moments, like a, like a poster, an epic poster, we might change up the building again. If we win the championship, we'll put up a baby photo of him, whatever we have to do, honestly. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that too. Also, that's just boss. It looks good and it looks so good that someone else who's pretty famous showed up and took a picture outside. Do you recognize him? That's Snoop Dogg, yo. <laughs> <laughs> so not only did, did he show up, but uh, the, the notional host selfie thing is taking off because Tessa Virtue, the, the amazing Canadian skater, 
uh, photoshopped herself into the picture <laughs> with Snoop Dogg in That's front of better. Kawhi Leonard. Yes. That's even better. <laughs> Look, this mural is not just an illustration of that amazing shot, but also the magic when the home team it goes deep in the playoffs. And unfortunately, with hockey, we didn't see it this year. But Adrian, what is it like in Toronto these days? Well, you know, Sunday night, it was raining at Jurassic Park. People were out there anyway. They did not leave. They were rewarded for that. It is, it is, it's the sort of lift the city needs, really. All right. Well, enjoy. That is the national <laughs> for May 21st. Good night. Good night. Good night.